Um, I'm glad you're, you're here today. Um, on behalf of Dakota State University, I'm very pleased to welcome to our campus the 30th Attorney General of South Dakota, Marty Jackley. Uh, General Jackley is a South Dakota native. I understand general is the appropriate form. I used to call him Mr., but it's really general. He's a South Dakota native raised in Sturgis. Do you have another mic? Do you have an army? Ride a horse. Oh, a horse. Okay, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? I mean, <laughs> not quite the same. Okay. <laughs> He graduated from the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology with a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering cum laude. He received his Juris Doctor degree, Doctor degree from the University of South Dakota School of Law. He served as a Judicial Law Clerk for the Chief Justice of the U.S. District Court for the District of South Dakota and as a Special Assistant Attorney General for South Dakota Prosecuting Controlled Substance Felonies. He previously served as a U.S. Attorney for the District of South Dakota and he's running for Governor of South Dakota in this November's election. He's just back from appearing before the United States Supreme Court last week on behalf of the state of South Dakota. He provided the oral arguments in a case dealing with the nature of sales tax for purchases made over the internet, while some online companies like Amazon agreed to collect taxes from all, all 45 states with tax codes, most have not. And South Dakota is one of over 20 states that have already passed legislation challenging that e-commerce companies must pay sales tax in the state where the purchases are made. Attorney General Jackley and his position brings to us important understandings and perspectives about cybersecurity, both in South Dakota and nationally, and we're delighted that he's taken the time to lead us in this forum today. So please join me in welcoming the Attorney General of South Dakota, Marty Jackley. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me tell you a little bit about y your president has really taken DSU and our state to the next level. In fact, she's so good, I would consider as Attorney General if somebody tries to recruit her or steal her to charge them with poaching or theft. Let's give her a round of applause for what she's done for South Dakota and for our university. You know, when she gave my background, she said electrical engineer. So I see a lot of students in the crowd, and, and I took a lot of somewhat similar classes that you've taken. I'm so old, though, they taught me Fortran, and I know some of you might not know what that is. In fact, I had a, a, what seemed to be a young kid that works in my office on working in my computer, and I was joking about that a little bit, and he looked at me and he said, well, you're a double E from the 90s. You don't know any of this new stuff. So uh, things have changed a little bit. but. I do have a passion for this area, and part of it goes back to that engineering background and the classes that, that I used to take. You know, when basically this last session came up, we looked at what areas do we need to do as a state to really protect our citizens and begin making some strong differences when it comes to data breaches, data security, and the conversation came up about what had happened with Equif Aqu uh, Equifax. I mean, Equifax was really the first time in South Dakota that most South Dakotans realized how important this topic is. I mean, there were hundreds of thousands of South Dakotans that lost a lot of their personal information. And they realized how important security really is. And it was frustrating for many South Dakotans because in that data breach, most South Dakotans had never done any business with Equifax. They'd never hired them, they'd never done a contract with them, they'd never paid anything, and they, they, were, they were calling my consumer division frustrated about how in the world did Equifax get all my information, and how in the world did they lose all my information, and what does it mean to me now? And it was a signal that we need to do several things differently in South Dakota to protect South Dakotans. And so hence came the data breach notification. Um, at the end of the day, every state had a data breach notification other than uh, South Dakota. We wanted as a state to be reasonable in putting forth what happens when a breach, what the obligations are, but without burdening a business. Because at the end of the day, uh, we didn't want to get in the business, the legislature or the attorney general, of telling a business in South Dakota what protections you need, what security you need. What we were really focused in on that bill was what you do when there's a data breach and the notifications that you have to give uh, in a set period of time to both the attorney general and ultimately the consumer. And we as a state decided it was important to make sure that when a breach happens that you notify the consumer, that the consumer at least 
is advised that there's potentially a loss of information and allows them to begin making some decisions. You know, I, I go back to Equifax. The thing that frustrated me uh, personally and as Attorney General with Equifax, they put all the burden on the South Dakotan or the consumer. They said, well, you can go to our website and you can type in some more personal information, including your social security number, in order to find out whether or not we've lost your information. And then they put up a bunch of other things that basically weren't fair to consumers, that you would have to pay for certain services because we lost your information, you need now more protection. I mean, none of that made sense. So the legislature overwhelmingly put together a strong data breach law. And I would suggest it's the platform. I'm not suggesting that we're done having the conversation. And in, in fact, you folks have a lot to add to that conversation. But at least now we have some very basic definitions in the state. We have some basic, very basic time frames that if something bad happens, people are notified. But there's more work to be done. And it's something that, frankly, you're hearing on a national level, whether Congress will ultimately put in um, some more basic and, and consistent rules so that we're not operating with 50 different sets of rules. And believe it or not, I support that. Uh, I, I openly uh, said, and, and we made some of South Dakota's legislation fit for the financial institutions and the healthcare institutions. We're not looking for double reporting. We're not looking to trip anybody up. I think a national law setting forth a data breach requirements would make sense, but Congress just simply isn't getting it done. And so we as a state felt strongly we needed to support that. And we feel strongly that that conversation is going to need to continue. Um, but I believe that it should be DSU and the experts that are setting forth the guidelines, setting forth the standards of what there needs to be for security to protect private information. I don't think it should be the Attorney General, and I don't know that it should necessarily be the legislature. I think it should be a guide rather than a mandate. And it's going to need to be something that's pretty flexible. Um, so I'm certainly, the big part of what I want to do today, of course, is to open it up for questions. But I wanted to start with that particular data breach law that we have, because in South Dakota, we took the step forward. It's something that you're going to hear more and more about. Uh, and it's important. And I think it's what really woke South Dakota up. And when I look at DSU, I see such a tremendous national opportunity, not just a state opportunity, not just a Madison opportunity, but a national opportunity. The fact that you're leading the nation, that you've got the national, you know, the, the national defense looking at you and relying upon you, you have hopefully more and more commercial opportunities, and that's a big part of what I'm going to talk about today and, and why I think it fits with the state. Um, we are now opening it up to not just cybersecurity, but a level of cyber, cyber investigations. It's a small sliver of it, but it's an important sliver of it. I will tell you in the function of Attorney General, more and more of the work of our forensic lab and our electronics unit is what you're learning about. It's what you're doing. It's less about DNA. It's less about fingerprints. It's less about firearm ballistics. It's more about IP addresses. It's more about the things that have been done uh, through the internet, the web, bank account information. And, and you know it's out there. I mean, it's a conversation going on right now in a Sioux Falls mayor's race. Um, I can't talk about it too much, but it's everywhere. And it's becoming more and more important. Uh, it's an issue that we rely upon technology. It's a beautiful thing. Believe me, as an electrical engineer, I love technology. But I recognize with it, there are dangers. And we need to have security walls and protections in place to protect our personal information uh, and to stop the bad guys from doing things. In fact, the president mentioned uh, my trip to the United States Supreme Court, and I will tell you from a lawyer's standpoint, I've never been so proud to represent South Dakota, never been so proud to be our attorney general, but the, the issue came up because I'm talking about there are 12,000 uh, jurisdictions that collect a sales tax, that we have computer software, 33 different companies that offer some type of software. It costs 12 bucks uh, for the initial package. And one of the justices asked the question, you know, what happens um, with your systems and your collection and everything if this, you get hacked or the systems fail? And it's no different than with the shipping side of things and everything else, but we as a country are so dependent upon technology, we need to do everything we can to protect uh, and make sure that, that the firewalls are up there. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to support that in my capacity as Attorney General. Um, I talked a little bit about the partnership. Trevor Jones should get a big uh, 
thank you from everybody at some point today. Trevor is the head of public safety. Uh, I like to joke with him, he gets to carry a firearm because he's also a special assistant attorney general. And uh, he convinced me, uh, it didn't take much convincing, but he sat in my office and said, there are wonderful things going on in Madison and we need to become a part of this. We need to be a partner in this. And so we moved forward uh, and invested. Uh, my part of it as attorney general was $250,000 uh, devoted to an investigation side of it. Uh, a partnership that we hope is just the start so that it includes an education component and training which is huge and we want to build it out to we want to utilize students we want to utilize your expertise to ultimately help us number one train our officers but number two solve crimes uh, i've seen it in a lot of the trial work that i do uh, it's an amazing way to catch the bad guys i mean the bad guys are using technology to hurt people we should use technology to help people and to catch, catch the bad guys. So that commitment's already been made. I know the governor's gonna be on campus here pretty soon again, and he's also made a commitment. Uh, you should thank him for that. Uh, it's, it's going in the right direction, and it needs to be uh, stronger and stronger as we move forward, but I think we're gonna see immediately the results from this and keep moving forward. You know, another part of this, what I think is so important, uh, and you see what's going on in Georgia and other places, and, and make no mistake about it, I think South Dakota needs to lead the nation in this area, not Georgia, it needs to be us. And I think you have the right team with your faculty, your students, uh, to do that. And I look at it as an economic opportunity. And that's why I think our state, whether it's the Attorney General or the Governor, needs to be invested. We need to invest uh, dollars, we need to uh, invest resources to do a couple of things. And, and the reason I say it's economic development if you truly bring in, and, and maybe it's 100 jobs at $100,000, I mean, that's a tax base for South Dakota. Those are important jobs. But I think it's much bigger than that. It's the commercial spinoff, the opportunities that hopefully will keep many of you in our state so that you have a job opportunity when you graduate to stay right here in Madison, to stay right here in South Dakota. Good jobs, jobs where you're making a difference, jobs that may be tied to national defense, national security, may be tied to the state, but that's economic development. And as a big part of economic development, and I realize this, there needs to be infrastructure. And I think that's where the state needs to be a strong partner. And when you think infrastructure, part of it needs to be building up a campus, part of it needs to be investing to make sure we have a strong campus, but the other part of it needs to be an infrastructure with housing. Um, as I've traveled the state, housing is an issue. And I recognize in this area, especially with the potential growth that's going to happen, we need to invest in, in a housing infrastructure. And part of that needs to be using the tools that we have. Some of it may mean adjusting some of the tools that we have. For example, we have a ready fund, which has been a strong tool for South Dakota. I believe it was Governor Mickelson that saw that tool as an opportunity for job growth. And as times have changed, interest rates are much lower that particular fund has dollars sitting there. My vision is to put those dollars to use. If there are opportunities that, are, that exist like right here to put dollars to work, to bring more tax revenues into our state, to bring better jobs for you, to expand education, we need to put those dollars to work. And I think that's a realistic opportunity right here in Madison. You know, another thing that's important to me, and, and I would encourage you, I put out a cyber initiative. That's how important it is to me as Attorney General, and I've got some other job application out there, but it's important. And I would suggest to you that please take a look at it and give me feedback. If there are things, I mean, you're the ones that are living this, you're the experts. If you've got ideas, give me feedback. But an area that's important to me, I have a 14-year-old son, and I have a 12-year-old daughter. And I see the tremendous opportunities that you present with, with basically K through 12 education. Opportunities that we don't need to just be limited to getting our law enforcement officers here in training, we need to get our teachers tied in. Whether it's through dual credits and other opportunities in a local area, but we need to have our teachers uh, understanding and appreciating, you know, times are changing, technology's changing. We need to, just like certain other skills, we need to give our kids the opportunity, I mean, I openly admit that my 14-year-old son, even though I'm an electrical engineer, he is at times much more proficient and utilizes the computers better than I do. I mean, he's always on them. When he gets done with track practice or baseball, he's on his computers. 
even his homework, uh, which amazes me, everything is on his computer. And with that, there needs to be a level of security. Because you, know, you have hackers out there, you have people that are up to no good. They can affect you know, maybe a homework assignment or grades. So I think it's a big part of this. We need to tie in our kids as a part of it. Now, I don't want to talk the whole time. I want to open it up for questions. I want to get your advice. Uh, I can talk more about jobs and investing, and I can do that as maybe the questions come, but I want you to direct the conversation. What questions do you have about the cyber investigation side? What questions do you have about the Governor's Office of Econ Economic Development Opportunities? What questions do you have about infrastructure? What advice do you have? Who has any questions? Yes. Uh, so as you mentioned, uh, infrastructure, uh, you said, is going to be a really important uh, tool for job growth here in South Dakota. Uh, are there any more plans for the Madison area and the DSU campus um, out past the completion of like the Madison Cyber Labs? There needs to be. And, and so the answer is yes. Is it, you know, when you look at campus, I mean, right now I looked at the numbers, and, and, and they fluctuate a little bit, but about half of the campus is online and half of the campus is, is what I'd say residential. And we need to make sure those opportunities are there. Um, and part of what you talk about on campus isn't just classroom buildings, of course, it, it has to be the housing side of it. Um, there's no reason to say things are landlocked. Expansion always exists. Um, it may require a little creativity, uh, but there needs to be an investment beyond what I would call the demolition and, and the, the, the building of the new structure. And you're gonna see that growth continue. If truly we are gonna lead the nation here, that growth, whether it's 100 jobs or 300 jobs, is going to require additional growth. If you tie it into commercial, that side of it is also going to have to grow. And so there needs to be a plan in place uh, to, to, to put in the infrastructure. And that's really where the state needs to partner strongly. When you talk about that infrastructure, I mean, that's getting things shovel ready. That's what perhaps the ready fund should be available for so that if there's going to be investments and there's going to need to be capital involved, that we have the dollars available to do expansion. And I think that expansion, like I said, I mean, what I would envision is a campus that doesn't just include what I would say is a traditional classroom, doesn't just include traditional housing, it should have a commercial component. And why shouldn't it? I mean, as, as you look at other institutions or other places, if you go to the South Dakota School of Mines, the incubator is on campus. It's a part of campus. And if you go to SDSU, the research park is right there part of campus. And so when you talk about the commercial opportunities and the big jobs, think big. We need to have the infrastructure there to, of course, include some of the other things that you would expect on a campus. But as things move forward on more online efforts and things move forward on the commercial side, um, which I would encourage you and, and urge you to focus on. I think you're going to need to have that available, and that's important. Other areas, great question. Other areas. Don't be bashful. You're going to hear me, or I'll just keep t talking if somebody isn't asking questions. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming here and uh, speaking with us today. Uh, my question is with attracting people to come into the state of South Dakota, what are your plans there? Because sometimes I don't think people can, in this field particularly, uh, the pay is kind of lower uh, and it might be harder to attract people from other states to come to South Dakota and start working in South Dakota. Great question. I mean, don't let the pay thing be an issue. I mean, and the reason I say that is, you know, part of you go to our, our cyber initiative, I mean, when you're talking a hundred, hundred thousand dollar a year jobs. Those are good jobs. Those are good jobs in South Dakota. We have a great cost of living opportunity here in South Dakota. We are a safe state. There are a lot of good opportunities here. Part of the answer needs to be, and I know there's always a desire to, to attract in talent. I would suggest this. Part of the focus needs to be right here in this room. I mean, you're going to be graduating. You're going to have job opportunities. We as a state need to convince you to stay here. If you want a commercial opportunity or a job and things open up, whether it be becoming faculty or doing other things, I mean, you're becoming the experts. We need to start with our homegrown. And so you're, you're here, you're available. Let's start with South Dakota kids. Secondly, let's bring some South Dakota kids back. 
I can tell you from engineering school, most of the guys and gals I graduated with absolutely wanted to live in the state. That's where their parents are from, their grandparents. Many of them came from small farms and ranches. They're married to the land. But they couldn't get an electrical engineering job in South Dakota, so they left. You know, Al Kurtenbach up in Brookings is a perfect example of that. He's an electrical engineer. He wanted to stay in the state, so you know what? He formed a pretty good business, Dactronics. It started out small. He took some chances. It worked out awful well for him. And so I think what we need to do is focus on existing kids that are here, bring back our homegrown, and then it comes to bringing in the additional talent. And I think that job will become easier and easier if we do a couple things. Number one, we need to be bold and positive that we're going to lead the nation so that when everybody looks to South Dakota, they know that they're the leaders of the nation. This is where we want to be from a professional standpoint to help with recruiting. Second of all, it's that infrastructure question. I mean, if you're going to move somebody here on a high paying job, you need to have a house available or at a minimum a lot so they can build a house and a contractor there to build it. And I think that's a key part of it. And it needs to be a continuing part of the conversation is what do we need to do as a state to partner with you, whether it's the Ready Fund, whether it's the Governor's Future Fund, whether you're looking at a particular TIF or other things, what tools are in the toolbox so that we can be a partner uh, and not just on the sidelines watching? Uh, this is important. And I think if, we, if you tie in all three of those, I think the opportunity is there. But I think you've got to have all three of them. And it really starts with continuing to promote Madison DSU as the national leader. Great question. Other areas? I think, did you have one? Yeah. Now, you were talking about infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> with the state being so small and they're looking at, you're looking at wanting more technology jobs, how is the state looking at a fiber backbone and the pipelines to handle this type of data? Because it's not a small task and I know the ISPs in this state are definitely not set for a task like that. Absolutely. So I had an opportunity to have a wonderful dinner with your president not, president not too long ago, and I asked the question. I said, you know, what do we need to do? And, and, and pick what, maybe it's to get from 3G to 5G. Let's skip 4G. Let's just go right to where we need to get to. What do we need to do with fiber optics? You know, I love fiber optics. It was my emphasis uh, in engineering school. And I will tell you, since the 90s, fiber optics and lasers have changed a lot. But what we need to do, to be honest with you, is invest in the equipment. Um, and part of that investing is um, working with some of the existing companies that are out there. I uh, had an opportunity to talk to Greg Dean and others about his vision. But some of it is, again, going back to there's a level of equipment that's out there. The technology is there, but you have to invest in it. And part of it is really our state's leadership to say, this is important. This is a priority. In other words, we have a $4.7 billion budget. There are a lot of things tugging at that $4.7 billion budget. But you have to prioritize. It's the same thing I do as Attorney General. I will tell you that I have a $26.5 million budget. And I have a lot of good sheriff's ideas, city police officers' ideas, state's attorney ideas, members from the public. But you have to make resource and budget decisions. And I think this is what I would call when you talk about broadband, when you talk about some of the fiber optics, when you talk about the equipment, you talk about the infrastructure that we're talking about, that's an investment. And it goes back to, do you want $70 million sitting in a fund earning no interest, or do you want to make that fund more flexible so that in that ready fund or in those future funds or other things, we don't want to compete with Floyd and the banks, um, but we want to make sure that when the banks are out there saying, we'll be a partner in this, but we're, there's a gap in funding or there's a gap in opportunity, and maybe that business wants to go the next step, we need to be able to do that. And the other reason I'll tell you why it's important as I've traveled the state and you, you talk to folks, I, I mentioned my 12-year-old and my 14-year-old. My kids, everything is on the computer. We have good internet service and peer. We're able to get the kids' homework done. But what would it be like if I lived a ways out in the country or I lived in one of those towns where I didn't have good internet service? 
my wife or I would have to go into the local town library and do homework, right? I mean, it would be a huge convenience issue and at some level a disadvantage. I mean, so when you talk about investing in the equipment, it's not just about, um, you know, new and better jobs. It's about education. It's about, you know, convenience of living. It's important. And everywhere I've traveled and I've talked about, you know, prioritizing an investment, South Dakotans believe, and I call it Connect South Dakota, uh, was part of the initiative that we rolled out. People like that. People say, yeah, if you're going to prioritize things, put that on a priority. And so it just won't be the state alone. It's going to take private industry. It's going to take a degree, uh, some of the state funds to help out. Um, but we can get this done. You know, some of this conversation, too, we talked a little bit about the Supreme Court. But one of the ways I led into my argument at the United States Supreme Court is what the federal government's doing, not just to Main Street on the price disadvantage, but it's robbing states of $100 billion over the next 10 years for education, health care, and infrastructure. For South Dakota, what that means, the governor says 50 million, the GAO start, uh, top end is 47 million, whatever that number is, when we win that lawsuit, that's $50 million a year more for the next governor in the legislature to invest in South Dakota and to do some good things with. Along with some of the other funds that we have out there, this is doable, this is realistic, and it's just gonna take some bold leadership and in and, and fairness, we've had strong leadership coming out of here. You know, the governor's invested $100 uh, million, I mean, that's, a, or excuse me, $10 million, which combined with Denny Sanford, Miles Beacom, it's been a priority, and it'll continue to be a priority. And public safety is investing in the investigation side with the Attorney General. We want to be your partners, and that's important. Great questions. Other questions? Yes. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this I'll is easy. You're a much easier crowd than the United States Supreme Court. You know, they only let me get about two sentences out, and it was off and running. Um, but there was a tension in your presentation, a tension between uh, your discussion of data security on the one hand and your discussion of uh, law enforcement on the other. Maybe it's a tension inherent in any attorney general's job, but it, it obtains a certain sharpness when the issue is cyber. Mm -hmm. uh, and in particular, it seems to me, uh, it's obscured by your discussion of data being stolen for that sounds like it brings on it under the jurisprudential analysis of burglary, say. But in fact, of course, the data wasn't stolen. The, the people still have their social security numbers. What was stolen Identity. was the quality of the data, which is privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, and that seems to bring it more under a kind of jurisprudential analysis like trespass or the peeping Tom rules and so on. And that, I think, you know, if we phrase it in terms of privacy, we begin to see more clearly the tension between the law enforcement side of your job and the data security side of your job. Let me give you an example. Gmail or Google and several other companies have begun openly discussing disappearing email, which is to say email that will be automatically deleted from their servers after a set period of time, which the user can decide. A week, and Snapchats and other things, yeah. Uh, and the first negative response to that came from law enforcement, which wants to see the preservation of records that can be searched with warrants and so on. This, on its face, it looks like a perfect, uh, something that we ought to support, that your office ought to support, as a way of increasing the very privacy that you know, your data security side wants. On the other hand, of course, the law enforcement side doesn't like it at all. They want to be able to use warrants and so on. What that sounds to the ordinary citizen is something like this. We demand privacy as long as it's not privacy from the government. You know, that, that, that's, all, that's a way to look at it, and most of that is fair. Um, in fact, that issue came up with the data breach legislation that, that I proposed. The question said, is this going to apply to the government? And I said, of course it will. If the government loses your information or gives somebody else access to it, loses your privacy like you've alluded to, um, the government should be under the, the same standards. I think part of that really evolves around this. 
when there's a data breach or there's some alleged illegal activity, the public looks to law enforcement. Maybe it's in the mayor's race. Maybe it's in other areas where a citizen has had their identity hacked. They call the sheriff, they call the attorney general, and they always expect action. And so part of the challenge is it's difficult to give action if we don't have evidence because obviously people are presumed innocent. We have to be able to look into the technology to see what email was done, what bank account information was hacked, all of that type of information. And there has been a tension. Um, Microsoft, I don't know if any of you followed it in the news, has servers overseas where they store information. And Microsoft took a position that even if law enforcement had a valid warrant, maybe even if it's something on a human trafficking case where we're trying to help out a young victim that's been trafficked, that information's off limits. That because of the privacy side of it, we can't look at it or use it. And of course, we took a different position. It was somewhat ironic that I was sitting in the United States Supreme Court when the decision came down where essentially Congress fixed that problem and said, you know, under certain rules and criteria, law enforcement can look at things. There is a tension there. I would suggest the way, and, and this has kind of always been my approach. If you're a law-abiding citizen, law enforcement needs to respect your privacy needs to respect the rules associated with that information, shouldn't be looking at it. But if you're somebody that's out there hurting people, we want to use every tool that's out there, number one, to get you to stop hurting people, and number two, to hold you accountable for that. And sometimes we need to look at that information. Um, that information can sometimes be a little challenging. I mean, I'll use as an example, I tried a no-body homicide in July of 2014, we've, we've still not found her yet, 58 searches. So I'm trying to use forensics and technology to convict a murderer. Part of the evidence in that case was her cell phone records. When you use a cell phone, they'll ping off certain towers. So we can generally, through proper warrants, figure out where you're at, okay? In that particular case, the victim's CPAP went off at, I think it was 10.04. So the fact that her cell phone was being used at 10.15 is a pretty big issue. What had happened, though, on those cell phones records is Verizon third parties out the contract. So there's a third party carrier of some of the text messages and some of the other information that we needed. And they don't have a, they don't restore or keep that information, so they destroyed it. And so we really needed to see a couple of text messages and some other things that, that were lost. The judge had a hard time with that. He's like, well, Jackley, you're the attorney general. I mean, go get that information. It's been destroyed. I mean, I can't go get something. Well, we sent out what we call preservation letters. So what we will typically do is when a case comes up, we don't know all the information. We don't know what's going to be relevant or what's going to be available. So we will start it out with a preservation letter to the company saying, we're doing an investigation. This is generally what we're looking at. Can you please preserve it? If you have a problem preserving it, let us know. Those, we rarely ever have a company that has a problem with that. Even the Microsoft thing, they didn't have a problem with the preservation side of it. But then you get to the next side of it is the search warrant and what information we get to see. Um, I think that if we had some national rules, and I would recommend when those rules are set, DSU needs to be a very big part of it, needs to tie in the law enforcement in that when are preservation letters appropriate, how long should information be kept, and when can law enforcement access certain things. Congress just took a step in the Microsoft case on it with out of country servers. I mean, it's a step in the right direction. But I'm always gonna wear that law enforcement hat because I use as an example that murder case. Without some of that technology, I wouldn't have got a conviction because I didn't have a body. I didn't have a witness. I needed phone records, text messages, those type of things to put a murderer in jail. Because I'm gonna tell you, if you're willing to kill your own mother, you're probably gonna kill somebody else again. And I know there's privacy concerns when we go looking into that information, but I, don't, I think those at times are outweighed by the need for law enforcement to protect the overall public. But when I say that, 
law enforcement needs to, number one, be very specific in what it's looking for. In other words, it shouldn't be out there fishing for people. Number two, there needs to be an appropriate preservation letter so private companies don't get jammed up. And three, there needs to be a judge's oversight. In other words, I'm in the executive branch of the government uh, as attorney general or the sheriff is or your state's attorney or whoever's looking. The judicial branch needs to say what we're doing is reasonable, that we're not invading that privacy. Um, and, and I think there's always a happy balance. Financial institutions have been able to figure it out with us. Um, frankly, hospitals have been able to figure it out with us. I think on the technology side and the privacy side, we still struggle a little bit with Google and Microsoft and these companies. There, there is a definite tension. In South Dakota, we've always been able to work through it. Some of it's about relationships. Um, the, the, the vice president of Facebook, back before he was vice president, had a little disagreement with me on this very topic. And he actually flew out to South Dakota to have a conversation with me. Because originally it, it was, you know, we need this information because we're trying to put a rapist in jail for crying out loud. Why are you pushing back? Don't push back. All right, I'll come see you. We'll work it out. We built a wonderful relationship where I pheasant hunted with him because he came to our state and loved our state. And he's somebody that I talk to. And you know, when the Facebook breach happened and all this bad stuff happened, it's about, it's about relationships. But I, I tell you that story because a segment of the public wants this information private. A lot of the companies want to be able to control this information. But then when stuff gets released, it becomes our problem because the public looks to us to solve it and says, hey, Facebook lost all my information and now I have an identity theft. Help me. Or somebody is you know, sex trafficked and we're trying to figure out who did it and we need this information. But you got to balance it. And I hope that when we did the data breach law that we balanced it. And one of the things that I told legislators in that notification, we as a state don't want to, and we're not ready to tell companies what security they need to have in place, what data security they need to be putting in place. We just need to say, look, when this information gets accessed, when this information gets out, we need to notify the consumers and we need to notify law enforcement so that we can properly address it. That tension's probably always gonna be there, but I think by sitting down, and I really think that's an area that could use a national rule, because if you have 50 states making 50 different rules, I mean, I'm a big states' rights person, but it doesn't make sense to necessarily put a company under 50 different sets of rules. And some of this is the United States Constitution, and it's the Fourth Amendment dealing with privacy. I mean, I think that's some of it's gonna be regulated by that, and the courts are gonna decide those different areas but there'll always be a level of tension. But the way you best resolve tension, you sit down, you talk about it, and you're as reasonable as you can be. And hopefully we as a country are gonna do a little bit more of that rather than what happened on the Microsoft server issue. Because the AGs got involved, uh, Congress got involved, the United States Supreme Court got involved. We should have sat down and resolved this way ahead of time. And it didn't turn out well for Microsoft. I mean, at the end of the day, who isn't gonna let a law enforcement officer catch a sexual predator, right? I mean, if that information's sitting on a server, we're not gonna let somebody continue to, 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 to hurt young, young girls. I mean, we're just not gonna. And we have to be able to get that information, but there's a right way to do it. And I, I use that example again because we didn't go about it the right way at the beginning, but we got to the right way at the end. And I think there's a way to do that. Great question, though. Not, not an easy topic. Other questions or other areas? Yes. Um, so what kind of plans do you guys have to help encourage computer science and cybersecurity education in the K through 12 curriculum here in South Dakota? And as well as keeping the prospective students here in South Dakota to find work and full-time jobs once they've graduated? Like I said earlier, that's a great question. That's straight to, the, to my heart and passion because I got a 12 and a 14 year old and I want them to go to school in South Dakota and I want them to grow up and live here so my grandkids are here. When you talk about K through 12, you know, there's a couple of things. You know, certainly the Secretary of Education who's appointed by the governor is a big say in this uh, as far as giving a voice and direction in, in emphasizing how important 
this field is. And I think that's a good place to start. I'm a big believer in, you know, call them college credits, call them dual credits, call it what you want. But I think that there needs to be a component of this where there is a dual credit opportunity, both in our tech schools and in our college settings um, in the area of K through 12. And I mean, it, it really starts with eighth grade, I'm finding out. I mean, my son is literally taking high school credits right now as an eighth grader to free him up so he can take dual credits in high school. And so I think it's fine to start it even in the middle school, but that's, that's, that's one of the areas. And then it's, frankly, what we're doing with the law enforcement side on the investigations, it's we need to get our teachers tied into this. Our teachers need to be at Madison. They need to, to see what's going on here. They themselves need to be up on this area. And we need to promote that, and we need to help with that. And we can do that. Um, there needs to be more focus on getting our high school level teachers to understand and appreciate it. Um, I think, you know, in Madison that's easy because of the proximity and, and along with some of the other areas around here. It becomes a little more challenging as you go further west or, or further south. But that's, I think, the, the, the best way to do it is, number one, to be a vocal focus on it. And I think as, as DSU continues to lead the nation in this topic, it's going to get easier and easier. But then that emphasis needs to be get the programs available, number one, for the kids on the dual credits, and number two, for the teachers to either be tie in on an internet basis on the website of it or physically here to see it, to learn about it, so they can bring it back into the classroom. The other thing is camps. I'm starting to see this with my kids. I get a little frustrated because it's all athletics right now. I've told my kids that you, know, you can go to a college campus on something educational too, not just basketball and football and other things, but what I've noticed as a parent, my kids so look forward to coming to the different campuses across South Dakota for the different camps. I think it's a week away from their parents, so they like it, but they stay in the dorms and they run around and they wear whatever school's shirts they were at. There's a lot of pride with that. I think there needs to be more camps associated with um, security. There's no reason to not get our kids active that way. Um, it's a big deal. I mean, I'm forking out as a parent a lot of dollars for both my kids to be on various campuses for athletic stuff. Let's focus, athletics is important. It's a, it's a growing experience for them to see different campuses. But why wouldn't we have those different camps and things available too where there's an education component? And it's a challenge. You know, I, I tried to get my daughter to go to School of Mines campus and she said, Dad, I'm gonna go to an SDSU basketball camp. I don't wanna go look at rocks. So I get that, you know, there, there can be some challenges there. But I think parents can help with that. I think having different camps available helps with that. Uh, and I think this, you know, the Secretary of Education and working with school counselors and other things is a very vital piece of that. Great question. So as you see to a lot of these answers, there isn't necessarily a silver bullet. It's a couple of different things that we can continue to do better. And part of this conversation too is, I'd like to listen to, if you have ideas to build on that or be a part of that, I'd, I'd certainly like those ideas too so that I can take them with. You know, I always give the example, we, we put out a pheasant initiative. And as part of that initiative, you see a $10 voluntary habitat stamp. That wasn't my idea. I was sitting in a group like this and, and we talked about, well, how can we build better habitat? And a citizen threw out that idea and I liked it. And then I floated it in other groups like this and everybody liked it. So guess what? We, we adopted it. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, government does not have all the solutions. You're a better part of that. Uh, you need to be a part of that. I mean, you are the experts. You're living it right now in this community and many of you as students. So don't be bashful. If you've got ideas too, please let us know. Other areas. Yes. So with like the Equifax thing, you had people coming to you going, well, how'd they get my data, stuff like that. You're a parent, I'm a parent. Have you ever sat down and looked at the software that your kids are using and the privacy policy and how they say we will share their data with other companies and they don't specify who these companies are. Is there anything that the government's looking at to make that sharing of our personal data more transparent so when we sign up for something, we know exactly who's gonna see our data and who that person's trading it with because that seems to be how these things are really happening now. It's not who we gave our data to, it's who 
they sold it off to? Great question. The answer is yes, and now because of Facebook, we are as a nation looking at that. We should have been looking at it after Equifax, but it seems like it was the Facebook situation, and I don't know that we fully know what all has happened with Facebook right now, um, is what we're looking into. And when I say we, Congress will likely talk about it, but we attorney generals actually have a working group. Um, we're very tied into this. We're trying to work with Facebook on this. You know, I tell you, as a parent, I haven't, I haven't always looked at those privacy things. I mean, what we try to watch is what our kids are on the internet doing. We try to watch um, what they're saying and doing with friends. It's a little challenging with Snapchat and other things. I mean, we're on top of it. Um, we are trusting parents, but we always verify, I think is the best way to put it. But I, I hadn't gone into those different privacy uh, settings. And part of the challenge is, we all rely on these, and so no matter what the privacy setting says, most South Dakotans are going to click it so they can use it, right? And so that's why I think we need to have a different set of rules that we're looking at. We're doing that after Facebook. Um, Facebook has us worried. We don't know the extent of what has happened on Facebook yet. Um, kind of like on the Equifax, I mean, we don't know the extent of the damage yet because we don't know where all that information went. So you could see a, a lot of identity theft and other issues come up. Might not be under my term as attorney general. Might be in five years, might be in 10 years. I mean, I think the repercussions of some of these major breaches, targets another one, um, is yet to come. And it is, I mean, it's an, it's an identity theft. It's, I mean, that personal information is still yours, but I will tell you, your social security number isn't as valuable after the bad guys have it and they've set up a bunch of credit cards and other things on your bank accounts. And, um, and then to get that identity back is sheer impossible. I mean, much of our consumer division, I mean, when Equifax happened, we were just, I mean, basically doing nothing but responding to concerns with Equifax, not even really getting down to the solution. And part of our problem in our state is we didn't have a data breach law. So, Equifax wasn't really too worried about the Attorney General. Now that we've actually made it a crime, I mean, I think we will have a bigger say in some of this stuff. Um, but it's, it's a problem. It's something that you're gonna see more about come out of the Facebook issue. Um, those are good Attorney Generals that are working on the Facebook side of it. I, want to, I don't wanna beat up on Facebook because I will give them credit. The day that breach happened, they were on the phone personally with Attorney Generals. I got the personal phone call. They are meeting with us and working on it. I'm not convinced Facebook knows how much damage and how much information has been lost yet, which is concerning. And that's why you're hearing different stories. Um, they're working with us, um, and they need to, because this is a bad situation, and all 50 attorney generals, consumer divisions are dealing with it. And I think it is putting an awareness on that box about how we're gonna share information. But you experience it anytime you go online shopping. I mean, if you go buy an item, um, some of you may have seen a recent shorts ad that I did when we purchased that pair of shorts, because my old ones, there's no way we're gonna put those on TV. But now they've targeted us. I'm getting all these ads to buy more short shorts. Believe me, that's the last pair of those shorts I bought. But I mean, they've targeted me. So they've taken my information, in, in which it's illegal. You can do that. But there is a level of invasion of privacy there. I mean, they follow every search you make, they follow every purchase you make, they sell it, and they use it. And that makes some people uneasy. I mean, I get the question a lot is, hey, I bought an item and you know, all of a sudden I'm getting all these ads. And I say, that's because they've targeted you. They took your information. Technology is a wonderful thing for them for their marketing, and they're using it. And it does make people feel uneasy. So it's, there is a tension there. And with what's been going on with Facebook and Equifax and Target, I think you're starting to see a shift in the public saying, we want some of our privacy back. And we need to be careful with that because some of that can affect growth and the things that are happening. And it all ties back into the importance of data security. If data is protected and it isn't lost, we don't hear it as much. I mean, you, you need to know this from a state's perspective and a local government perspective. We don't have strong firewalls up protecting a lot of government information. And that's part of what this all needs to be when you talk about investing and the hope is you've got the expertise to give us that. 
whether it's your senior design projects, whether it's a commercial spin-off that you do, whether it's you educating folks to do it, but we're in part banking on investing in you, which is the governor's 10 million, it's what the attorney general's doing, it's what public safety's doing, so that we can do a better job on the local government level and on the state level protecting our information, and that's, that's important. And we see it because I'm gonna tell you as attorney general, you know, there's those scams that were going around and they're still going around where the bad guys will get into a system and freeze it up and it's called the ransom. And they will say, okay, we won't let you get into your information unless you pay us X number of dollars. And then they call our office and they call the FBI and it's a mess. And in some instances, the businesses have to pay the ransom. And we don't want that to happen on a state level. We don't want that to happen on a local government sheriff's sensitive information level. We need to invest in that infrastructure and those firewalls to protect that security. And we're counting on you guys to help us with that. And that's in part why we're investing in you. I don't know how much time I got left. Yep, way up here, Delon. Marty, uh, the, the Wayfair case is near and dear to my heart as a retailer. How do you foresee uh, best ways to spend that funding when we win the case? I will, you know, later today you should thank Delon. As when he was president of the retailers, he was a force behind making this happen. And it's important to South Dakota. I'll tell you what I told the Supreme Court. I mean, I really think there's four, depending upon how you want to count them, five ways that need to be looked at. But I would like to see it go to education, healthcare, and infrastructure. And then the other two components would be, because it's built into the sales tax increase, um, either reducing the, the half cent on the sales tax or some property tax relief. That's gonna be a dispute in the legislature. We'll have to sort that out. Um, there's an amendment called the Partridge Amendment that would, it would lean towards the sales tax side of it because of the drought and some of the egg prices and the uncertainty with the farm bill. We might have to look at a, at, a, at a level of the property tax side, but the main three things will be, again, education, healthcare, and infrastructure, two of which are a big part of what we're talking about today uh, because it's huge. And it's, it's not a one-time money it's a recurring money. And I'm gonna to submit to you that case is much more than $50 million because when you save Main Street, um, when you no longer have a price disadvantage when you buy that item here in South Dakota, you're gonna see more profits, you're gonna see more sales, you're gonna see more jobs, you're gonna see more healthcare being supplied by employers, by retailers. So I think it's much more than that, but at start it's gonna be $50 million a year and that's what my vision would be to do with it. In fact, that's what I told the United States Supreme Court. And I think that's what the members of the legislature are gonna to wanna to do with it. Other questions? Yes. Given the example you just mentioned, the box that South Dakotans would just click on because they, nobody reads the end user license agreement, given the complexity of that, and with the Facebook situation in Equifax, do you think that the government or members of the government have enough technical knowledge to fully understand that situation, to write legislation that's specific enough to address the different situations of each company to, to protect the citizens that way. It takes a lot of you know, contextual knowledge and technical knowledge to do that. And legislation usually has to be, has to cover many cases when, when they do it. Great question. I think, generally speaking, um, government bodies would lack that general expertise. You have that expertise, and so whether it's in the form of guidelines or suggestions, that's important. But that, that main complexity is why when we brought forth the data breach law, there were conversations initially about, well, can we make this, you know, some very basic guidelines on what you have to have for security? And I said, no, because every business is different. Um, technology is changing you'll be setting up a small business person for trouble by doing that. And I think it's a bad idea. I don't know that you're capable of having a one size fits all. I think what you are capable of though, is DSU, the leader in the nation, having a guideline so that a small business can look at that and say, okay, these are different sets of guidelines for different general parameters of a business. I mean, each business is different, but you know, you have small businesses and you have more internet-based businesses and some that have maybe a little bit more personal information. You know, everybody's got credit card type information, so some of that could be consistent. 
but I would think a general guidebook makes a lot more sense. And, and, and we don't just do it in this area. I mean, I've done it as attorney general. I mean, body-worn cameras is a good example. The attorney general put together the stakeholders um, and said, put up a guide so that 66 different sheriffs that are in 66 different counties with different problems and are 100 or so different chiefs of police can have a guidebook so they can look at it and, and get suggestions on it and follow it if they want to. Um, and, and I think that's the better approach. I, I never believe that the 105 members of the legislature, as good as they are and as hard as they work, should necessarily be getting that technical. And we got a little technical in the data breach law. I mean, if you look at the definitions, there was a lot of work that went into those definitions because it sets a level of platform of defining things in this field. It's not the end all be all. It's what uh, I think other representatives are going to be bringing some additional bills. And so we focus pretty heavy on the definitions. And, and there's a couple of pages of definitions. And that's why we did that. And, and it was just on the breach side of it. So I think it would get too technical. I think the better approach is you folks, you the experts, giving us guidance and not putting that necessarily into law. I just don't see it working. I think it would be too heavily regulated. One size wouldn't fit. I mean, just one size isn't going to work here. Other questions? Yes. As a sophomore, I'm primarily focused on internships. So with the addition of Mad Labs and just in general for South Dakota, will we be seeing growth in summer internship opportunities for cybersecurity? I absolutely hope so. And I think the answer is, I think, pretty easily going to be yes. I mean, I will tell you, I believe strongly in internships. I mean, it's, I got internships when I was in engineering school. I got internships when I was in law school. It helped uh, my education. It gave me practical experience. I think it's great for kids. I do it as attorney general. We bring in a lot of help in the summer, uh, both on the, on the agent side, along with our forensic lab side, along with our lawyer side, along with our training side. Because we get work out of the kids, but frankly, we're helping with their education and plus we're giving them a level of interest. So that is my hope. And, and, and the hope is too that the state helps further partner with that. I mean, we have various different scholarships that are out there. Um, I always believed in expanding those scholarships. Uh, you're going to hear me openly talk more and more about apprenticeships, where we are relying more and more on employers to help with the education component. And in a field like this, that is so valuable because you're on the job training is a very vital part of that education. It's that practical experience. And so the answer is absolutely hope so. Absolutely want to partner in that because that, and that also, frankly, if you build a component of you know, more commercial being tied into education, that's how we keep you here. I mean, you're a sophomore. My hope is, is that by the time you graduate, you've got job opportunities here. And part of it is whether it's an internship, an apprenticeship, or whatever, you've begun working in a relationship with a business. You've learned those skills to work with that business. You get your job here, and you stay right here. And I think that's an important piece of this. And that's, that's a much more effective way to do than to hire a, a headhunter and try to bring in people to South Dakota. Let's keep our kids that are already here, right here in South Dakota. Other questions? I don't know how I'm doing time-wise. I'll, I'll go until they throw me out. Uh, so as you said earlier, it's important to have a balance between um, privacy and working with law enforcement. Um, what do you think of the trend that companies are having of locking um, users, or users' data that they're using through their service behind a wall that they can't even access to the point where the, only the user can access that data. There's no way for the company or law enforcement to get to that data. That's a great question. We saw a little bit of that in Apple. I mean, when I say we, it was the federal government, but in law enforcement in general was different security system setups that don't allow access to that information. I will tell you why that concerns me. And it goes back to, if I'm hot on the trail of a human trafficker that's trafficking young women, why wouldn't you help me catch them? I mean, if you've got the data or the information there, I mean, I don't believe in fishing. I don't think law enforcement ought to be out looking for trouble. But when trouble comes our way, and we're legitimately trying to help a citizen, I don't know that we should put up blockades for that. I mean, if it's 
one of your daughters, one of your sons, you're going to want us to do everything we can to protect them and help them. And I think the warrant process is a, is a perfect process. It's where we have to come forth with probable cause, which is a reason to believe a crime was committed and somebody committed it, and a justifiable tie to the information we're looking for with specificity of where we're looking. And then there's a level of transparency for that because after we're done, that search warrant is on file at the courthouse. So any one of you can go look at what we were doing. There's very few limitations of sealing that. It would only be to protect a legitimate business interest. Um, you know, if we had looked at something that you know, was a false trail or something and we wanted to protect that business. But I've just felt as both a parent and, a, and tied to law enforcement, there are just some people out there really hurting folks. And to suggest we're gonna put up something that would not allow law enforcement to catch a bad guy, it doesn't make any sense to me. And I don't think it makes any sense to the public, but we have to be reasonable about it. I mean, we have to, you know, the Fourth Amendment protects privacy. Unlawful and unreasonable searches and seizures. I don't, I mean, I feel pretty strongly though that a group like you, if the Apple phone were there and I was trying to catch somebody that's maybe perping on young 12 year old little girls, I could probably bring you that phone and say, hey, help me break this code so I can catch the bad guy. And it probably wouldn't take you too long. So I think the technology's there. That whole Apple thing was a mess. It was fumbled by the FBI. It was fumbled by Apple. We attorney generals almost stepped in on it because of that. Uh, they were able to get things fi figured out and resolved. Um, they probably could have handled it at the front end by doing the password thing better by taking it to folks like you that would have gotten it right quickly. Um, and that's again why the training is so important. I wanna pull it back to you know, why, we, why have I invested $250,000 in the training? We need the law enforcement to understand this. And the step is you're the experts, this is leading the nation right here. We want you to teach our police officers so that we don't type in the wrong password three times and lock things up. I mean, we need to know some of these basic things so that our men and women out there trying to protect the public can. But I don't support automatically, what, whether it's what Microsoft did or what Apple talked about. And at the time Apple came up, I was in an interesting place. I was chairman of the nation's attorney generals, which meant I sat down and met with Apple and all the major companies. And we sat down and had the conversation and I told them pretty much what I told you. And that is, if you think for one minute, I'm gonna stand by and let you protect a rapist, you're wrong. And I don't think any court or the, the court of public opinion would ever let you do that. And because of, I think, some of those conversations, they understood that while the attorney generals hadn't engaged yet, we were about to. And I think that's how they were able to get things resolved with the FBI and some of what was going on. Other questions? Yes. I have a two-part K-12 question for you. Okay. Um, so many I'm states... I'm used to the Supreme Court. They give me like five-part. All right. Well, they, we can they, do five. Yeah. We can do five. <laughs> and then they interrupt me after I say the. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so the two parts. So many states around the nation at the uh, state level are requiring computer science, cybersecurity for graduation requirements. So I'd like your thoughts on that. And then the second part for K-12 is... Uh, there seems to be a flurry around the nation of teacher walkouts because of pay. Uh, and I know we've done some stuff at the state to move us from 51st to 40, whatever we are right now. Um, what's your goal on teacher pay and, and how do we make sure that we're not West Virginia or wherever else sure. where teachers are walking out? Sure. To answer, you know, the, the first question, when you look at are you going to mandate certain subjects, I've always believed in it, rather than mandate it, incentivize it. Incentivize it by number one, teaching everybody how important it is, and number two, tying it to governor scholarships or opportunity scholarships to say, for you to qualify for this, the incentive is you have to take these courses. Now we have to offer them, and so that goes back to, if we're gonna incentivize it that way, in fairness to the kids, we gotta get the program going where we've got the, the educators prepared to be able to teach them in our classrooms. So I would be very much supportive of incentivizing it and getting down, and that ties back into getting things ready. 
you know, on teacher pay, South Dakota did take a, a, a pretty bold step. Um, there was obviously the half cent increase. You haven't heard me advocating necessarily, it's called the Partridge Amendment where we lose the half cent. Um, the legislature is going to get to decide that, but you're going to have a governor that's going to have a, an opportunity to weigh in pretty heavy on that. I mean, I'll just be point blank with you. Education is important to me because I got a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old. My mom was my high school accounting teacher. Education is job growth and, and economic development. Um, you're going to see me working with education. You're going to hear me talking about, too, you know, we as a state, as part of that transition over into teacher pay, we went from just focused on the student. We used to have, you know, under the student formula, you'd get about $5,400 to $5,600 a student. And we shifted the focus maybe a little more on the student-teacher ratio. That's been painful for some of our more rural districts and some of our smaller school districts. Um, we need to take another look at that. And with that ties in some of the pay issues. Um, as we continue to also look at opportunities that are going to come up with education, you know, recently as Attorney General, I settled a part of what was uh, left on the due diligence part of tobacco, and it was about a $27.5 million settlement. And you saw how important education is to me because the way we crafted the settlement, the dollars went into the educational fund. There's about $500 million in that fund right now. There's a statute that says about 4% 4 4 of that gets dished out to education. There's some other factors in that. We're looking at another fairly large settlement opportunity on tobacco. I'm not suggesting it's going to get done while I'm attorney general. The hope is it gets done, though, for the next attorney general. And I'm going to do everything I can to move it forward. When those dollars come in, we're going to have to make some decisions as a state. Do we put it in that fund and do we leave it at 4% or do we structure it? And I'm very open to structuring it to saying when it comes to teacher pay opportunities or education opportunities to say, put it in the fund, leave the $500 million there, but this is new money, structure it with a COLA understanding so that we're responsible for it, but allow a little bit more of those dollars to get out, to get out to the school districts to help the teacher pay issue. The other thing we need to do on the teacher pay issues, we need to focus, and this goes to incentive, and this probably goes to the formula that I'm talking about, but if we have an area as important as this, and sometimes it's maybe math or other areas where we need teachers. We need an incentive to teachers to come here to, to, to basically learn areas that are maybe a little foreign to them. Then we ought to incentivize that and use some of those dollars under the formula to say if you're offering certain classes that are triggered or you know part of the governor scholarships or the opportunity scholarships, then that ought to be a part of the incentive factor. And so I think there's ways to do it within reason. I'm not sitting here and suggesting to you that I'm going to go crazy on, not, I'm not a high tax dollar guy, I'm, but for better use of those tax dollars and looking for opportunities like I've talked about, whether it's a tobacco settlement or a mortgage settlement or what I'm doing on the treatment side with the pharmaceutical companies to see that there's buckets out there or what we're doing with the internet sales tax. We're not going to get every one of those buckets, but we should have strong leadership to pursue and bold leadership to pursue those opportunities and when they come in, responsibly use those dollars. And you know what my priorities are because I've talked about them today. Other questions? Yes. So a lot of databases, or a lot of the data breaches come from phishing and mining of people and their, their tendencies to, oh, I got this email. I need to go it open it. Um, has the state thought about you know, teaching high schoolers a basic, this is what fishing looks like, even pushing it to the general public. Because as cybersecurity people, we get taught this in class, but the business students don't, art students don't, most of the general population doesn't. So they get these emails, you know, it's I, it, back in tax time, the phone calls come out, oh, you know, it's the IRS, they're getting emails. Is there any push for more education for the general public? Sure. You know, you bring up that question, you know, about the, you know, clicking on the email that, you know, are unwanted. And I will tell you, I run the attorney general's office much like a business. And so we, as part of our office, run those um, drills, so to speak, to see about, you know, to help educate em employees. And even at CAG's office, I got 189 people running around 
lo and behold, one of them opens up that email they weren't supposed to and fails the test, and then we've got to run more of them. So it happens. But it's always encouraging businesses to continue to do that. You ask about, is the state doing anything? Not specifically, but there was that tension between Google and some of the companies with the AGs. So Google started an actual program for that where they go into the schools and make it fun. Uh, I was a part of a couple of them where you come into the school and you teach all about exactly that and protecting information. In fact, I always remember the first one I went to, they said, well, give me your cell phone. And my code at the time was, one, 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 one. And so they got a little testing on, you know, they graded it, and I got an F, F on it, obviously. Um, and so, but they began that process with the kids. It was a wonderful program. Um, they're doing it scattered. Um, Facebook does a little bit of that, too. Um, those programs have worked well. The state, to my knowledge, hasn't done anything like that. We haven't had the resources to do it. But when those companies like Google or Facebook or Apple want to come in, uh, AT&T is another one. I mean, they're working with me on another project. The companies have dollars available for this type of training. And we as a state need to tap into those dollars. And I go back to, again, you're the experts in this field. I mean, we're, we're to some degree investing in you and relying on you. And my ask is make some of those part of your senior projects. Help us, help us as a state better protect that data and that information. Become the national leaders. Um, these are great ideas. Um, we need to do more of that kind of effort. Um, it's, a, it's a reminder of me probably when I leave here to contact Google and see when they're going to bring the next couple, uh, we call them the road shows out here. And they make it, the, the reason that's so effective, they made it a fun day for the kids. I mean, they made a lot of fun of the attorney general and the kids had a blast with it. And I bet if the governor showed up, or the president of a college, uh, or a business leader out there. They'll, they'll pick on you a little bit, they'll make it fun, but those kids figured out after that day how important security is, how important your passwords are, how important it is to not post something that everybody will see forever. They just did a really good job, and they were young kids. And the ones that I got to work with, they were literally just Google employees, and they go off and do these things. And they take a, you know, that's their week, week break, and they go off and travel the states and have a lot of fun doing it. So we've had a great conversation. I just want to go back to thanking you for leading the nation and leading our state in a very important topic. And I want to also thank you for making it not just cybersecurity, making it cyber investigations, and including law enforcement and your attorney general in part of such an important mission. So good luck. I look forward to seeing great things from you. God bless and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I, I want to say we're very grateful for your support, your commitment of funds to help us in the uh, uh, Mad Labs, the Digital Forensics Lab. Uh, those of you who aren't aware of what's going on, you'll be hearing things coming along soon as we expand and uh, begin to populate those labs and develop the partnerships of the kind that you're talking about, um, and that there will be opportunities for students. Um, so we really want to thank you for taking some time out of your day to come here, run this forum. Uh, you, you heard from the questions, there's a lot yeah. of interest, obviously. And uh, you're welcome back anytime. Thank so you. Uh, thank you very much for your interest in this area. Thank Excellent. you for what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>